Sandy Patty's name is synonymous with Christian music. Her tender heart and extraordinary voice have reached around the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Many may not know the roots of her ministry. It began with a mother and a father's love planted years before in another time, another place. It always felt like a very safe place. It always felt like a, a good place to be. And I think, you know, looking back on it, it's because my parents created an atmosphere of love. I think it has given the kids a sense of where they belong. That if everything in the world turns against them, they know that mom and dad and Mike and Craig and Sandy, the, the, they know that that's a, that's a unit that they can really count on. We hope that we just um, were showing them that we were putting God first. And then everything else is going to work out. The Patty family grew up with music, grew up in church, and often lived on the road with their music ministry. Good soil for a father-daughter relationship. Sandy and I have always been real close. And uh, we've just had a special relationship. Sometimes you don't really capture the depth of that feeling until you do something really actively, like sitting down and recalling some of the most precious memories. And then you realize you just have a, a treasure. That treasure of fatherhood was celebrated in a letter from Sandy to her dad, Father's Day, 1990. Says, hi, Daddy. You never get too old to call your dad, Daddy. I'm sitting here in my hotel room in Los Angeles, suddenly realizing that Father's Day is coming up. I was wondering what I could give you that you don't have or don't need. And then so many heartfelt thoughts came to me about how I feel about you. And I knew I could give you some of what's in my heart. I began making a list in my head about you, why I'm thankful for you. How you you've helped, helped me grow. grow. And I very much want to share with you those pearls. First, I'm glad I have a daddy. So many kids, old and young, don't even have a daddy for one reason or another. And my life seems less fragmented because I do. Two, I'm glad I have a daddy who wanted me and still wants me for his child. It is a most precious gift to be wanted. Three, I'm glad I have a daddy who loves me with his whole heart. Fourth, I'm glad I have a daddy who was never too busy and still is never too busy to stop what he's doing to give a hug or fix a bike tire or take a little girl with a broken arm to the hospital or cook breakfast in the desert on a Saturday morning or, or hang, hang up, up some pictures, pictures in his grandchildren's room or stop to listen to a grown woman who's still his daughter say some hard things in this process of growing up. I'm glad I have a daddy who loves my mommy. A man who treats his God-given mate with such tenderness, love, and humor. Parents being and staying together seem so rare these days, and I'm glad for your example. I'm glad I have a daddy who is crazy about my children. How lucky they are. You give them access to so much of yourself. Right now, it's flips and walks and hits in the stomach and swinging. But what you are saying to them is, they matter. I'm glad I have a daddy who trusts me and has always been in my corner saying, you can do it. Hang in there. And I'm glad you trust me even when we don't agree. I suppose that's the truest test. I know you're always there not to say... See, I told you so. But to let me rest on your shoulder and swing on the back porch without having to say anything. Daddy, I pledge to you in honor of this Father's Day to be not only a faithful and loving daughter, but a faithful and loving friend. Life changes a lot of things. It changes people, relationships, attitudes, and so forth. But one thing that can never change but only get better is the fact that you are my daddy whom I love with my whole heart. And on this day to honor fathers, you are honored 
among them. I love you. And today. I love you today. Sandra Faye. Boy, that's my little girl. And I'm really thankful for her. And I think as heartfelt as these words were Friday, June 13th, 1990, they're even more heartfelt now. He's been my hero for a long time. I guess the main goal we had was that we would hope that Sandy would just be a real Christian gal. And then, uh, since I was minister of music, why we exposed the kids to music, you know, all their lives. And when Sandy was about three years old, why she loved to sing. And so I started a little choir of three to five year olds in our church in Phoenix, where I was minister of music. So. Sandy was in that choir, and then she's been in a choir program ever since she was three years old, and uh, we tried to do little productions and things like that, and I uh, never really had a goal for Sandy to be a great concert artist, but, uh, you know, she had so much musical talent and so much personality that she connected whenever she would sing, so um, uh, I just wanted her to be what God wanted her to be. I guess that's really boils down to my goal for her. When you look back and, and uh, how you raised Sandy, what are some of the most important things that you think you did as a father? Uh, start over? Uh, from that, first question's okay. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. um, if you want to start over, I can. I mean, okay, well, why don't we do the first question again? What okay. I won't say anything different because that's really... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. What was, the, what was uh, maybe the, the goal you had as a father and as a parent when you were raising Sandy? Well, I, uh, I guess the main goal that, that we both had was for Sandy to, to know Christ and to be a real, genuine Christian. And then secondarily, uh, Sandy, we knew when she was real little that she could sing. She, you know, she could just match parts and one time we thought she was singing off and we looked in the back seat and uh, she was you know we thought what in the world's wrong with her and then we discovered she's trying to sing a part like we do and so she got onto that real quickly so when she is three years old why I started a little old choir three year three four and five year old kids and and so Sandy's been in a graded choir program from the time she was three till she got out of uh, high school and then went to college and sang in the choir and so I had no idea that she would uh, be accepted so well by people all across the country and so forth, but uh, she's always been a real great Christian gal, and that's been our primary goal. And the music and everything, is just uh, it's, it's wonderful, but it's, it's secondary. When you look back on how you raised Sandy, what are some of the important things that you can look to that, that played a role in, in helping her to become a Christian? Well, um, I would say that uh, just taking time to be with the kids. I'd usually come home uh, maybe 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening, and I usually had something of an evening that, you know, either a youth meeting or a choir rehearsal or a Bible study or something connected with the church that I had to do. But uh, when I got home, I, I would try to crowd as much as I could with the kids. And, of course, I know Carolyn really appreciated that Absolutely. because she had to wrestle with them all day long. And, and, uh, and I just loved to let them just crawl all over me and beat me up and play and flip them and just like we do with the grandkids today. And uh, so the, I think a big thing was playing with them and letting them know that their dad was, was uh, a real friend. And then, you know, the talks that we would have... Uh, when their, their disappointments and their successes, we tried to uh, be with them in, in those times. And um, I know when Sandy was about uh, in the eighth grade, I think she gave her life to Christ. And uh, 
she has just uh, responded to the right uh, in life. And, of course, the rightest thing is Christ. And so I really, I really don't know, except we've just tried to have a happy home. I didn't, I don't, I didn't want the kids to have bad dreams, and I tried to let them know that uh, I wasn't going to go to sleep until they were asleep. Because I know when I was a kid and I felt like everybody was asleep and I was still awake, I was a little afraid. So I try, we just tried to make our home where the kids felt they could be themselves. And uh, I hope that was right. What are, what are some of the special memories that you have when you look back on raising children? Uh, but, okay. uh, looking back, I mean, what are some of the things that come to your mind, first of all, when you think back to, to those young years when uh, our boys? Uh, oh, I think of um, when Sandy was a cheerleader and uh, she would you know, bring the kids to our house and practice their cheers and everything. And then when she was in um, the musical group in high school, why she would say, Dad, can we use your equipment? That school stuff is lousy, you know. And so Carol and I may have to change some concerts so that our equipment could be available, but we did that. And so Sandy would drag our equipment and she'd, Dad, Dad, we don't know how to hook this up. Is there a chance you could come and, and hook it up for us? So I ended up running the sound half the time for their school things. And uh, uh, just just different things like that to where if she had a volleyball game or if she had a concert or if she was in a play. And the same with Mike and Craig. You know, we just tried to be there. And, uh, and our highlights really were, I, I, I think, going uh, from a ball game with Mike to a ball game with Sandy, to a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, to a choir practice, and then a ball game with me all on the same night. And our kids just, we all just loved that uh, so very, very much. So we were just together. I, I think that would probably sum it up. We, we did things together. Why, why, why is it so important <coughs> as a parent or a father to do that, to be together? Oh, goodness, I hadn't really analyzed that. But I just think it gives the kids a sense of security. They know that things are going to be all right. And uh, we go out on the desert and, and cook breakfast. And none of us are real campers, but we loved to get up and go out on the desert and, and cook breakfast and, uh, and just be together and laugh and, uh, and cry and pray and sing. Uh, I think it has given the kids a sense of where they belong that if everything in the world turns against them, they know that Mom and Dad and Mike and Craig and Sandy, the, the, they know that that's a, that's a unit that they can really count on. And I, without just taking time to analyze it, I would say off the cuff that that would be it. And would you say that uh, uh, that, that would be the, some of the right things that you did as a parent, as a father? I would say if there's any right thing that I did, it would be this togetherness and making them feel at home and that we love them. But we, wouldn't, we didn't condone when they did wrong, but we tried to let them know that we loved them, even though we also let them know that we didn't approve if they did, if they did something wrong and, and so forth. But we wanted them always to feel like that, uh, that they really were loved not just by us, but by each other, you know, that Mike loved Sandy, and Sandy loved Mike, and Craig loved Sandy, and so forth, that uh, um, I would say if there's anything right that we did, as I look at them now, grown, they still have that same, they love to be together, and I think, hey, that's one thing I did right. So I'm not sure how many things I did right. I've always thought, well, when they, I'll see how they raise their kids, and I'll know what I did right. But um, this togetherness, to me, is a big thing. When you see them together, <laughs> like they are today, loving each other, how does that make you feel? Oh, yes. Makes me feel so good. Makes me feel so good. It, it, and I think of how God must feel a lot of times whenever uh, his children 
don't get along, you know, and fuss about this and fuss about that and, and are so competitive. Man, our kids, they all have a competitive spirit, but they're not competitive with each other. Mike is just so glad. Craig is so glad for what has happened to Sandy. And then Sandy is so glad when anything like anything good happens with Mike and Craig. They're not, com they don't even, they don't even think of each other as stars or anything like that. They're just brothers and sisters that love each other. As a father, how did you draw upon the strength that, that God could give you when you look back for inspiration or wisdom? Or how did you draw on his, his, his strength? I, myself, when I gave my cry, life to Christ as a sophomore in high school, I made up my mind that he was number one. And that's always been the case. I mean, as much as I love Carolyn and as much as I love the kids, he still is, is number one. Of course, that makes me love Carolyn more, and that makes me love the kids more. And I've never really thought about, uh, you know, like a textbook of how to raise kids and so forth. I've always felt that if I did today what Christ wanted me to do, that I was going to be the right kind of father. And so that's been my main thing, is just to try to be today what uh, he wants me to be. And uh, sometimes, you know, he wants me to, 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 to correct the kids, you know, and, when, and this and that, and, and hopefully to have the wisdom to show them I still love them, even though I may spank them. Uh, and then uh, sometimes he used to play with them, and sometimes to sit down and just talk with them, and, Sometimes just to listen to their stories and stuff like that. I, I'm not smart enough to be a good parent without, uh, without knowing Christ. I just really am not. Do you think some parents today get, get too uh, concerned about doing the right thing and they just don't allow themselves to yeah. be a father? I do too. They're, they're, I really feel that, uh, that they, they read so many, and they're good books, but books are only, it's kind of like a budget. You have a budget to know how far you stray, you know, from different things. Well, a book is, is, is real good if you just don't think that's, the, that's all true. But if you can take the good things and then let that be a part of you, and then you be that kind of a parent or that kind of a person, that's good. But if you just say, well, chapter 6 says at this point I ought to be doing this with the children, and I must, I must reserve some time with these children. I, even though I hate to, I must reserve that. You know, kids sense that. They 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 just sense that. So yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, too much of uh, parents saying, "Well, I should be doing this," and uh, where where they sh they should feel like, "Why don't I want to do this?" and and get something straightened out there. Do you remember the time uh, you received the letter from Sandy for Father's Day? Oh my. I do. Well, um, Sandy and I have always been real close. And uh, we've just had a special relationship. I'm and not even sure, you know, how long ago it was or anything, but, but she, was in, she was in some city in some hotel room, and I think she was thinking about Dad. And, uh, you know, uh, she just, uh, I think it was around Father's Day, and, and uh, she just told me what she thought of me. And I can take um, hurts, and I can take, um, you know, I've played a lot of sports enough to get up and go again. But, boy, when it comes to real good tender things, I'm just a big baby. <laughs> and those really touch me. Did it make you feel like you, you accomplished uh, what you wanted to set out to as a father or hope to as a father? Well, I had felt that way before in Sandy because Sandy has always shown a love for Christ um, that has always just made me so proud of her. And uh, so uh, that, that letter just made me uh, feel good. It was, I was just real thankful that Sandy felt that way uh, toward me. And uh, it, 
I, I, you know, it didn't take that letter to make me feel that Sandy was what we wanted her to be. But that letter was just so sweet. It's just Sandy. That's what it is. Does she still call you Daddy? Yeah, she does. She called me Daddy. And uh, all the kids, uh, um, well, Carolyn calls me Dad. And and uh, the kids, see, Mike, I think he calls me Dad. Uh, but Sandy calls me Daddy. And I like it. Is there a song that Sandy sings that, that kind of epitomizes Some song that comes to mind that she sings? Um, not necessarily that she sings, although We Shall Behold Him. I remember when she first ran across that number, she came to our house. She says, Dad, you better sit down. I'm going to sing you a song. And uh, she knows how I feel about seeing Jesus, you know. That's going to be a great day. So when she sang that, I just, whew, man, it was just too much. So that song, I think, is kind of special. And then Sandy and I have been singing a, a duet for ever since she was in high school. We sing um, uh, kind of a couple of verses and a couple of choruses of it, of it Took a Miracle. And then we go into kind of an operatic thing and, oh, how I love him and so forth. And I'm a high tenor and she's a high soprano. So we both just really give it everything we have. And that's our song. Would uh, would you be able to read the letter, Ron? I still have it. I still have it. Yeah. <clears throat> now, do I have to read it out loud? Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> well, can I use my glasses? Yeah. Sure. sure. Okay. Would Grandpa could? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm a Grandpa. Are you? <laughs> uh, perhaps both. Uh, mainly for audio. I know for audio, but uh, I may use it in Spanish. Uh, no. All right. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna do that. Uh, we're gonna do the reenactment uh, at another place of him reading it. But it, he'll be just oh, reading. Okay. He won't be he won't be reading it out loud in the next one. Okay. Well, I see it's dated Friday, June the thirteenth, nineteen ninety. Says hi, Daddy. You never get too old to call your dad, Daddy. I'm sitting here in my hotel room in, I think, L.A., suddenly realizing that Father's Day is coming up. I'm not so good at remembering well enough in advance, but I don't think I ever forget altogether. I was wondering what I could give you that you don't have or don't need. Father's Days are a time of giving Dad things they don't need. Ha! And then so many heartfelt thoughts came to me about how I feel about you, and I know I could give you something of what's in my heart. I begin making a list in my head about you, why I'm thankful for you. How you've helped me grow, and I very much want to share with you those pearls. First, I'm glad I have a daddy, so many kids, old and young don't even have a daddy for one reason or another. And my life seems less fragmented because I do. Secondly, I'm glad I have a daddy who wanted me and still wants me for his child. It is a most precious gift to be wanted. Third, I'm glad I have a daddy who loves me with his whole heart. Fourth, I'm glad I have a daddy who was never too busy and still is never too busy to stop what he's doing to give a hug or fix a bike tire or take a little girl with a broken arm to the hospital or cook breakfast in the desert on a Saturday morning or hang up some pictures in his grandchildren's rooms or stop and listen to a grown woman who still his daughter say some hard things in the process of growing up. I'm glad, fifth, I'm glad I have a daddy who loves my mommy, a man who treats his God-given mate with such tenderness, love, and humor. Parents being and staying together seems so rare these days, and I'm glad for your example. 
6, I'm glad I have a daddy who is crazy about my children. How lucky they are you give them access to so much of yourself. Right now, it's flips and walks and hits in the stomach and swinging. But what you are saying to them is they matter a great deal to you and I believe as they grow and the world begins to take all the more of them you have anchored them with love and acceptance so they can hopefully stand firm in who they are seventh I'm glad I have a daddy who has made effort after effort until he made some great connection with the other man in my life John my heart is so full when I see the two of you growing together. Thank you for not giving up. I'm glad I have a daddy who trusts me and has always been in my corner saying, you can do it. Hang in there. And I'm glad you trust me even when we don't agree. I suppose that's the trust test. I'm glad you let me grow and let me screw up sometimes. I know you're always there to say, not to say, See, I told you so. But to let me rest on your shoulder and swing on the back porch without having to say anything. Daddy, I pledge to you in honor at the, of this Father's Day to be not only a faithful and loving daughter, but a faithful and loving friend. I also pledge to be a listener for you, as you have been for me. I want to hear your joys. And I want to hear your hard things, too. Life changes a lot of things. It changes people, relationships, attitudes, and so forth. But one thing that can never change, but only gets better, is the fact that you are my daddy, whom I love with my whole heart. And on this day, to honor fathers, you are honored among men. I love you today, Sandy. I'm sorry to, to let that touch me so much, but boy, that's my little girl, and I'm really thankful for her. Take my glasses off. <laughs> is, there, is there one particular part of that letter that just is more special than another? Well, as I read it, I hadn't read it in a long, long time. As I read it, you remind me of what we had talked about, this togetherness. She mentioned that several times, that uh, just... Knowing that we're there means a lot to her. And, uh, boy, I'm glad she senses that. Because we all go through rough things. And I suppose that that's what, that's what I sense in that letter, is that, uh, that we are together. <clears throat> Goodness. Of the video that, that you said that you had had, you've taken all your eight millimeter film. Mm-hmm. Uh, any special part of that, that that is really more memorable or, or to you? I don't really think so. I, I think what we did most of the time, we, uh, of course, in those days, you know, you didn't have the VCR that was so easy, and so we didn't have a lot of money, so we kind of took pictures of their birthdays mainly. So the, um, the, uh, I guess probably seventy percent of the of the film has to do with their with their birthdays and their events and so forth. And uh, just to see, you know, Sandy, you know, six months old and crawling, and then and then going to a year old, and then two years old, and then here's her little brother Mike. And well, it's just a family uh, progression, and uh, uh, 
I think what means a lot to me is that when I gave this to the kids um, as a surprise in Christmas of 1985, I thought they will they'll won't even like it until they're 50. But I just felt, you know, really impressed to do that. And it was a lot of work, as you know it would be. And uh, so I gave each of the kids one. And about a, two days later, they all came to me and they said, Dad, we can't believe this. This is wonderful. I said, you mean you've already watched it? They said, we've watched it three or four times. Says, what person wouldn't give all they had to be able to see their whole life in an hour and a half? And she says, that's what you've given us. And I mean, they said, that's what you've given us. And they've loved it about a thousand times more than I thought they would. Chris, another thing that I think was, that was great about this video, not only can you see your life in front of you, but Ron took all of our tapes, our records that the children sang with us as a family. We have the, the three children singing when they're, you know, five, six, seven. Just as soon as Craig could sing a part, then they had a trio. So he started with that. And so while they're seeing their whole life, they're hearing themselves sing from that age clear up to, uh, I don't know, yeah. 15 years ago. And that makes it extra special. You're not just watching silent movies. You're listening to yourself singing, too. They love that. I wish I could have something like that of our past. Is, uh, what, is there any particular part of the video more memorable to you, Carol? Well, uh, not really. Uh, I think the interesting thing now is to see them watch it with their children and their children seeing them as they were little babies, and that's just fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. So that's probably what I'd say now. What, uh, what did you feel like uh, you may have done right as a parent? Well, I mean, it's been covered really terrific here. But I was thinking both Ron and I are fortunate that we had Christian parents who loved each other and who loved us. And we've had wonderful examples that we could draw on. And then we tried in our young life to always put God first in our home and then the church. And our children loved all the activities that were involved, Ron being a minister of music and youth. He had all the graded choir programs. So... Our kids have always been in those choirs, and they loved it. They loved all the activities. So they've grown up around music, and um, uh, music is my background, and so I was determined that Sandy was going to have the same privilege that I had on the piano. So when she was six, well, we took her to the best teacher that we could find in Phoenix where we lived, and so she studied piano up through uh, sophomore year in high school. At that point, she said, Mom, Dad, how would it be if I started taking voice lessons? We said, great, I think that's wonderful. So she has a terrific background in piano, and uh, so now she's doing that for her daughter also. So we saw uh, when she was a little girl wanting to put a program on mother and daughter, we were asked, Sandy and I, to give a little program. Sandy was only three. And so it was a mother-daughter banquet. We uh, put about a five, ten-minute program together. She changed her hats and put umbrellas, and we changed songs, medleys, and the girl loved it. So she's had music all of her life. We're talking about letters today, it seems. And when Sandy was a sophomore in high school, well, she was in high school. She, we lived in San Diego. She tried out for Disneyland and did not. Now she's a real spokesman for Disney World, which is so funny. But, you know, she came home and wondered if she would make it. Finally, the letter came. She didn't make it. The child was really devastated. And I remember she went to her room, and her dad wrote her a letter. And she got that letter. So they have a letter thing going. On. That's pretty good. Okay. Good. <laughs> They're 30 minutes long. Yeah. With my stuff, we, we do a little video in some of our concerts. And of course, some of the things that you can look back on and, and feel like you did right. Well, you know, that's one job we get no training, except our parents before us is a good example. But, you know, one thing that was very important to me, Chris, 
and to Ron. We were ministers of music, had three little children, didn't have any money, but we wanted our children to come home and me be there. I really wanted that. My mother had done it. His mother had done it. It's very important to me. Now, I understand that there are single families and single parents and mothers cannot do that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I chose to not have a lot of clothes, a lot of things, so that I could be there. In fact, today, Sandy will even say, Mom, the first thing I remember coming home is saying, Mom, and she says, and you'd say, what was your day like? And she said, I really thought you meant it. So that was important, not only to me, but to them. So I really chose to stay at home. Now, when the children were older, then I worked at the church and different things. But to me, that was a real plus in my life, going home and knowing my mother was going to be there. So I, I, that's a plus, I mm -hmm. think. Any other things that you look back and, and you think? Uh, well, important? music was important to me to pass that on to my children. And so not only did Sandy take piano lessons, but the boys had to take <laughs> them too. And they talked me into letting them quit when they're in junior high and now they wish that I had not let them quit because they're making their livelihood singing concerts as we all do and they needed a little more training but that was a real I wanted to give my children that heritage and I'm glad that we did. What's the foundation of uh, Sandy's career and the boys career and, and your own career? I know uh, has Sandy been more successful than you could have ever imagined? Or? Never even dreamed such a thing would happen to the child. Never a dream. But as Ron says, we've always known Sandy was special. And it's so neat to watch people all over the world now know the child we've always known. But no, we had no idea at all. She didn't either. The boys didn't either. And we're all in her corner just rooting her on. And, and what's the foundation? I guess more, not only her career, but her, but her life as well that, that you were able to in her with Ron as far as her relationship with the Lord? Well, I think she hopefully saw our example that uh, we chose to put God first in every decision we made every day. We didn't make it a big deal uh, vocally Holier with than words, that, you know. but we hoped we were making an impression by just a natural day. Uh, we tried to give our children a natural, normal, what's normal? But normal for us at the time, we felt, was just a normal life. Their friends were coming over. You know, I see so many children that are raised, and their parents uh, tell them they're so extra special. Their little children around the corner don't even know who they are. I thought that was a mistake. Uh, we wanted them to know that we were there, hey, uh, bring your children, bring your friends. Uh, we're all going to go to church tonight because that's what we like to do. I don't know. In a normal situation, we hope that we just um, were showing them that we were putting God first. And then everything else is going to work out. It'll be tough, but it's going to work out. Anything you'd like to add, Carolyn? Or? Well, I just, um, this is kind of centering around uh, little Sandy, and Gloria was so sweet to put this nice letter in the book. And uh, what I tell people, what I hear all the time, as a mother about Sandy, they'll say, I can't believe she's just a real person. And I can truthfully tell them, you know what? She really is just a real yes. person. You can trust her. You can trust her. Your your children can follow in her footsteps, and it'll be okay. What are uh, some of the, when you think back on, uh, on things that happened in Sandy's life and things that you were able to instill in her, what are some of the feelings you have as a mother? Well, the Disneyland thing was a big thing to her, <coughs> not making that. And, um, but yet she handled it like a real trooper, like a Christian young woman would. She waded through the rough part and came out okay because she had God's help. That made me as a mother proud. And I've watched her making many decisions and... Um, you know, uh, in high school, there were things that I would say, Sandy, I may not like what you're going to do, but I would sure like to know about it. 
in case anything happens. I need to know where you are or who you're with. Now, I may not like what you're doing, but I would sure like to know where you are. And uh, when I was being raised, I was not allowed to do anything. So I didn't want my daughter raised that way where she had to learn to lie to me because I learned to lie to my parents. And I, so I wanted her to know that, look, I'm your friend. I'm not just your mom. I'm your friend. Let's go through this together. So we've always had a real good close relationship. Thanks for mm -hmm. that. And our boys also. Mm -hmm. Ron, did you have anything you'd, you'd want to add? Or? Well, uh, there was something that, uh, that, that came to my mind while, uh, well, well, Carolyn was talking about uh, how Sandy and and she had always uh, been free to you know to talk to each other and everything. But I I think if you would ask the kids, they would tell you that when they came home from school, and Carolyn being there, their mom being there, I would say that that is rates way high on what they feel is is important and uh, uh, that plants a lot in their in their minds I, I, I wish more people today could work that out uh, to where the the parent could be home when their kids to get them off to school and could be home when their kids uh, especially when they're in the first second third grade and so forth I, I think that's real um, that's real important and this music uh, boy, Carolyn is the musician, and the kids got their talent from their mom. I love to sing, but I'm not in the class that she is, and and the kids have that, you know. And you just look, all of us are making our living, making their living, you know, singing. And uh, it's because of what this gal, the the stuff that she that she passed on to them. And. I wish I wish they could make their living with sports. I love sports, but they can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's it as far as the interview. Unless uh, we could just get can we get a reaction shot like of Carolyn listening to Ron and Alan sing? Sure. Sure. Um, Let's go to the uh, last Ron's uh, What happened? Uh, I guess when. Did you not imagine anything? No, like no, really. And, uh, in fact, our kids um, all love to sing. So when I think Craig was in junior high school, while we uh, started singing as a family, and we uh, did so we'd take maybe a couple of weeks off and so forth. You got it? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, that uh, you, we would maybe take a couple of weeks off from the church work, and uh, instead of taking a vacation, we'd go on tour. And we worked out a real nice program. We took a, a an organ, we took a piano, we took cement blocks to build a stage on, we took all uh, plywood to put on the stage, uh, we took uh, timpani, uh, drums, lights. <laughs> we took everything in a. I don't how we ever loaded up. I don't know, but uh, Sandy got. Let me see. Ron was. Pastoring in San Diego, and Sandy was in high school, and we got to thinking, hey, if we're going to do it as a family, yeah. we'd better get started. <laughs> so we did. Uh, we started doing uh, concerts during the summertime, and uh, then Ron, we were doing so well that Ron resigned from the church, and we went full time for a while. So the kids all wanted to go off to college, and that's how we did that. Yeah. Is that how you got here at Anderson, to Anderson College? Or? Well, we went to, no, we went to college here as teenagers. Mm -hmm. Then we went our separate. Southern Texas into Arizona and California and so forth. So that's mm -hmm. that's where we're headed to today. We're This is our first leg of our winter tour. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Talk, talk, talk. Yeah, yeah. When you see uh, Sandy on stage, uh, how proud do you get as a mom? Well, pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> proud. Yeah. 
You know, one of the proudest times I had was going to Radio City Music Hall a couple of years ago. And she sold out the place. In fact, I have a poster over there that says sold out, you know, Radio City Music Hall, a Christian artist. And we were there. Sandy wanted us to be there. So we sat in the audience. And I'm thinking, here I am in New York City. And I look around, and all these people in New York City love to hear my daughter sing. That was a special moment yeah, for me. Yeah, that's right. Okay. You should be in New York. And you should be in New York. Talk to me about the book at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you say, are we ready? I'll get rid of this. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Me? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sandy, can you tell me what it was like uh, growing up with uh, Ron and Carolyn and your brothers? My household um, was always full of laughter, music. Um, I suppose if you talk to my two younger brothers, you might get a different story. Um, I felt like I was helping them grow. They felt like I was a bit bossy. <laughs> growing up, um, but uh, we had a lot of fun in our family. I was telling someone the other day, uh, well, my, my dad was the minister of music, the minister of youth, and did all the children's choirs at our church. I mean, and as an adult, I understand the enormous amount of time that he put into those responsibilities, and yet he never, ever made us feel like he wasn't available. I mean, I remember him being home a lot. And when he was home, he was very involved in, in what we were doing and um, always the games and interested. And we loved it when my mom had to go somewhere and he would babysit because he would always make it really fun for us. And fun and laughter and music are something that I just vividly remember being a part of my upbringing. How much your part was music when you were growing up? I think your father said that you joined the choir at three and you haven't stopped since. My, my dad um, was responsible for all the children's choirs at church, and so uh, they started at three. And um, I always loved singing. Um, you know, when you're around it a lot, you just kind of get comfortable with that. I, I know that in the car we would sing a lot and learn songs. and um, So I was exposed to music a great deal of the time and really developed a real love for it. And I think... You know, with those two factors, being exposed to it, and then, you know, you have some choice to make about whether you like it or not. And I just was really drawn to music, and I thought, felt like music was a great way of expressing, you know, just some things inside of me, which I still very much feel. And um, so it's just kind of just been hand in hand, you know, where some families, you know, it's always sports. Um, my family was always, you know, music. What was it like to travel with uh, your family when you began to do that? Mostly it was fun. <laughs> but, um, you know, when you get five people um, in a van traveling across country, there are some tense moments um, with two younger brothers who suddenly you can't boss them around anymore because suddenly they're bigger than you are. Um, changes things a little bit. And um, we enjoyed singing together. Um, and it was a great experience. Uh, my, my brothers and myself have really drawn on that experience even now as we kind of are doing our separate things. But learning to read music and learning to blend and learning to make up a part are all things that we use in our musical lives now. And uh, that is directly uh, an effect of traveling together. And we knew what we, especially for myself, when I um, started traveling and making records, I was, I had kind of known a little bit that process and knew that the road was not always glamorous. There was some very, you know, hard work that went along with that. And so uh, that was a tremendous uh, preparation for a lot of what I'm doing now. What were some of the special memories you have of your father growing up? You know, when you first ask me that, the, the very first thing that comes to my mind um, is in Phoenix, where I was at the time, we would, from time to time, get up very, very early on Saturday morning. You have to understand the significance of us getting up early for anything. Um, 
And we would go out into the desert, and my dad would build a little campfire, and um, he would fix everybody breakfast on um, that Saturday morning. And I just remember how fun that was to do something just so out of the ordinary, just so very, very different. Um, I remember that uh, he always had time for me. Um, he, he just never made you feel like, never made me feel like that I was an intrusion in his life. Um, that's said in a lot of ways when you're younger, just by saying, you know, Dad, can you tie my shoe? And he immediately says yes. But it's also, you know, sets a pattern for as you get older. And you say, Dad, do you have a minute? I need to talk to you about school. Absolutely. What do you want to know? Or, you know, what do you want to say? And that's something that I find myself, I, I see that it's not always that easy. He made it seem really easy. But as a mother now, I find myself, um, saying to my kids, just a minute, a lot. And I know how it feels to have, have somebody just be ready for whatever you want to say to them. And so I want to transfer that to my children as well. It's a great lesson that I learned from my dad. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that, that, you know, Ron and Carolyn did right as parents when they were raising you and your, and your brothers? I think they, they showed us what a loving relationship can be between two people, first of all. Um, you know, my dad just adores and loves and respects, and, you know, my, my mom is his best friend. And that's not just in his words. I mean, I've seen that. Um, so that's, you know, one, definitely one thing. And they, they always made us feel... Um, very loved, very, very special. That I'm, I just remember the feeling, the atmosphere in my home. I was always glad to get home from somewhere. It always felt like a very safe place. It always felt like a, a good place to be. And I think, you know, looking back on it, it's because my parents created an atmosphere of love. And so that's what. I was anticipating when I would, you know, be somewhere and come home. Um, they took time for us. You know, they planned time to be with the kids, but they also took time to be with the kids, too, because sometimes you can't always plan those special times that happen. They just happen, and they were, they were ready for those. Um, Those are just some things off the top of my head. Yeah. What, uh, I think uh, Ron said that he had done a, uh, a video. I think he took your 8 millimeter. If my voice is so low, it's <laughs> only because my sore throat. <laughs> uh, he took your 8 millimeter film that he used and uh, he put it in a video. Mm -hmm. Is there anything on there that, that uh, you particularly remember uh, that was special? If you can think back to what the, what's on the video. Um. As a child, I think I, looking at that, there, um, if, I, if I didn't know that person in the video, I would look at the video and say, what a happy child. You know, there must have been some really good things happening in her, surrounding her life to uh, make her seem so happy. And that's, you know, that's, that's the thing that just kind of stood out to me was that um, on my face, as a child, there was just a real sense of um, worth and a, a feeling of being in a place where you felt really loved and liked and wanted. And um, you can't manufacture. Kids cannot pretend that. And that's what I, I look at my eyes and my face and those pictures as a kid and see there's a great deal of joy. How do you, when, during your career now, and how much has your father influenced you? Not only maybe by what you may call him up or ask him for advice, but just knowing what he's done for you already. You... Um, actually, he's had a tremendous influence on me because of an, well, for a lot of reasons. Um, he really introduced me to music. 
helped me um, understand music, to learn to read, to understand how you know a singer communicates and all of those things. But when he was, when I was first born, he traveled with Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians. I don't know if he talked to you about that no. much at all. I don't even know if you know who they are, <laughs> <laughs> but the older generation would know. I'm kind of old. Uh, but he traveled with Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians, which was a wonderful choral group that did a lot of traveling. And he learned in that, um, from that experience how to put a program together, how to make an evening worthwhile to that person who bought a ticket and came to the, to the concert. Um, and I think he passed on to me so many of just those little helpful, you know, helpful little things about the ebb and flow of an audience and kind of programming with that in mind and, you know, you can't do everything up. Um, you have to program a little bit of downtime to make the communication. You know, the bottom line is communication, which mm -hmm. is something else that I really picked up from him. It doesn't matter how you sing or how good the musicians are or whatever. If you don't communicate, it's all moot. And so communication with your eyes, with your face, with your words, with your body language. Um, with just your vulnerability um, to transmit beyond the stage. He always said, too, that um, what you do on stage is diminished by about 50% by the time it reaches the audience. So you have to be a little more animated, which is just kind of part of that whole process, which is sometimes why I have a hard time doing TV, because I'm too animated. <laughs> um, but just little things like that to um, help in the style of performing that I do, and choosing songs that reflect where I'm at, rather than trying to say something that, um, in a way that somebody else would say it, that doesn't really fit me, to make what I do an extension of who I am. Um, you know, just those kinds of things that I have really drawn on and continue to do so. How did uh, Ron and, and Carolyn influence your relationship with the Lord? The, yeah. biggest, uh, the biggest thing that they um, demonstrated as well as said to me is that, you know, God loved me no matter what. And, um, but they, they couldn't decide for me to have a personal relationship with him that at some point that was my choice. Um, but, but they gave me some good foundation to be able to make that choice on my own, mostly with the example of their life and the way that I would see um, them put into practice. Um, just principles from God's word and the way you treat people or the way you respond to someone who says something harsh to you or, you know, just things like that that you don't really realize you're observing as a child, but you really are. Um, and so when I was eight, in fact, it was my birthday, July 12th, um, the year I turned eight, that I gave my heart to the Lord. And um, I remember, you know, I wasn't a bad kid at all, but I remember just feeling like, as good as I feel about my life, with the Lord it'll be even better. And I think a lot of kids go through some really hard times, and you don't really have to. You know, for those, for those kids who really are good kids and like their parents and get along with their teachers, and um, that doesn't mean that you need God any less, that he can fulfill your life and make your life even more complete than it already is. How did they nurture that relationship that you began when you were eight? Well, one of the, one of the ways was um, being involved in church. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ways was um, talking about it. Um, whether it was family devotions, which we kind of had regularly, but not really. Um, one of the ways was... Um, seeing how they talked about it, either with each other or, you know, 
with us or whatever. Um, and then the times when we would do something that maybe we didn't understand the significance, they would really take the time to affirm you know, those things, to say, I don't know if you realize what you did, or, but I'm just so proud of you, and, and here's several reasons why, and you know, really affirm the, the decisions and the choices that I tried to make you know, to the best of an 8 or 10 year old or a 12 year old, you know, with the limited knowledge that kid has. Mm -hmm. When uh, the influence that your parents had on you, and particularly Ron, how has that helped you as a mother? Tremendously. Um, to sort of repeat myself, I guess, a little bit. He always, you know, he always had time for us. And I, I know now, hearing my parents talk, we didn't have a lot of money when we were kids. And I remember my dad saying at the end of the month, he'd, he'd kind of put his hand down the, the, the rocking chair to see if there was any change that had slipped down because we needed lunch money. You know, I didn't know any of that. I never felt any of that. Um, which just says to me that um, acceptance and love and accessibility to a parent money cannot buy. You can't, you can't buy your kid's affection. You have to earn it. Um, you can't buy their love and their trust and their support. You, know, you have to earn that. And that, a lot of times, you know, there's, a, there's a, definitely a place for quality time. I mean, I think quality time is vital. But sometimes you don't get to the quality time unless there's quantity time. Um, and my parents offered me both. And I want to offer my kids both, too. When you remember what they did for you, what kind of feelings do you have? As a parent myself now, um, as much as I appreciated it then, I appreciate it from a whole different standpoint. I know what it's like to clean up your living room six times a day. And you clean it up only to have the toys, you know, thrown out again. I know what it's like to, to uh, wash your kids' clothes and take their little socks out and just get this warm feeling of, of I love doing this for my family. And I know what it's like to, you know, fix dinner and think, oh, I bet Jonathan's going to really like this tonight. To be, to everything you do, be so motivated by wanting to love your family. And I called my mother one day and said to her, I understand now. And I, I understand the, you know, the times that you, I know you've cleaned up your living room six times a day when we were kids and I know the hours that you you put into us and you never complained and you never made us feel like we were in your way or that we were a hardship or anything and I just I just want you to know that I didn't thank you then like I should have and so 30 years later you know thank you for all that that all that you did I think you understand what your parents did for you better when you are a parent yourself. What was Carolyn like as a mother? Always consistent. Um, a lot quieter than my dad, much more in the background. That's kind of her nature. And yet, um, you know, she was mom. She was always there. I'm, one of the best feelings in my whole life is um, knowing that when I got home from school, she would be there to say, how was your day? And I remember one time, she kind of stopped saying it for a while. So finally, I asked her after a couple of weeks, I think, I don't know how long it was. I said, Mom, I said, you haven't been asking me how was your day. And she said, well, honey, I just thought that maybe, you know, you kind of got tired of me asking that. And I said, no, I, I didn't. I like it when you ask me that. And that's just such a great feeling of knowing, you know, when you get home, your mom's going to be there. It's pretty neat. What kind of relationship do you have with Ron and Carolyn today? Actually, 
the last, probably the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, our relationship has really changed. And not, not necessarily bad, but sometimes the process of that change is a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. Because you, you, you're trying to say to them, yes, I'm still your daughter, but I'm a grown woman now, too, with a family of my own. And things are a little bit different. And to, to get to a relationship, really with anybody, but with your parents, to be able to express differences of opinion, to be able to say, I respect what you're saying, but um, I don't agree, and here's what I'm going to do. That process is very difficult. But I think now, I would say, and I think they probably would too, that my relationship with them is better than it ever has been. It's richer, it's fuller, it's more dimensional. Um, it's more satisfying, I think, to both of us. Um, and I'm just so thankful for that. Uh, yes, I'm still their daughter. I will always be. My dad is still my daddy. will always be my daddy. And I still sit on his lap sometimes. And my mom is my mom. And she and I, since I have had children, have just taken our relationship to a much deeper level because we're both mothers now. And there's that aspect of that relationship too, not just mother-daughter, but from mother to mother. And that's very, that's very rewarding to me. Well, what's your, what kind of a grandfather is Ron? Oh my goodness. He is like one major entertainment center. <laughs> he, he is always doing something with the kids. He built, he built them a little Snow White cottage. He, um, he's always, I mean, he wants toys for Christmas so that he can have them around for when the grandkids come over. He's, he's always playing with them, you know, whether it's flips, whether it's them hitting him, whether it's climbing on his back, whether it's doing somersaults. I mean, he just, we just crack up. He's just like the best babysitter in the whole world. Um, and my kids, you know, they just are crazy about him. And my mom, she'll say real often, you see how he is with your kids? That's how he was when you kids were little. And that's kind of neat. He's, he's definitely a grandpa. He's a dad. But he hasn't lost the child that's in him either. What did you mean in the letter when you said you could just sit on the porch and not have to say anything with your dad? Back in, in the back of their house, there's this wonderful little porch swing that um, there have been times, this one particular time comes to mind when we had the fire here at our offices. And I remember going over there and just sitting there with my dad, with his arm around me. And you know, there really wasn't anything to say. There really wasn't really even the time to be having the conversation. Um, things are going to be okay. You're going to get through this. It just just was a time to be together and just kind of feel the sorrow of, of the loss and just being together and in silence and just rocking back and forth. How long ago was that? Was that that you... was uh, almost two years ago now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they, I think they said they've been in that house four years now? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, you play basketball down there in the back? No. <laughs> I personally don't, <laughs> but uh, I do play a mean game of ping pong. <laughs> Down there in the ping pong table? Uh -huh. What are the uh, special things he does with the kids that uh, your, grand, your children, his grandchildren? He was saying that he plays computer games, I think. Uh, he does computers, um, whether it's a, from the two-year-old to the ten-year-old, um, whatever, you know, whatever the age requires, you know, he does that. There's lots of computer games that they, all the kids love to do. Um, they love getting in the spa and just playing around in the jacuzzi that they have down there mm -hmm. or playing basketball. One of their favorite things to do is he lays on the floor and they come running at him and he flips them over his head. And um, They all love that from, from the two-year-old to the, to the ten-year-old niece and nephew. Um, 
basically anything the kids want to do, he'll do. You know, he, he fixed up a trolley in the backyard and a huge burlap swing that swings out over this big hill and um, built a snow white cottage, they call it, little playhouse for them mm -hmm. on the back porch. And he's just crazy about them, and they are crazy about him too. When did uh, you get the inspiration, I guess, or the feeling of writing the letter? I was out in um, California working on a record, and I always, I've always been late. I'm usually gone or something, and Father's Day, or not so much his birthday, but Father's Day tends to slip up on me, because it's not always the same date mm -hmm. every year. And uh, this was, I think, the weekend before Father's Day, and I had really been thinking about about him a lot, just kind of missing him. So I just, I sat down to just jot him a very quick little note. And so much came, just so much came into my heart that I wanted to tell him. So I just decided to. And uh, I faxed it even to him. I faxed it to the office and then they put it in an envelope and send it over to him. But you know, sometimes we, not that we take each other for granted, but sometimes we hesitate or just don't think about saying things to people that we care about because you think, well, they know. They know how I feel about them, you know? And I'm learning that in my own life, people that I care about, I don't always know how they feel about me unless they tell me. And I just felt like that it was time to just tell my dad some real specific things about him and why I'm proud of him as my dad and as the grandfather of my kids. And, and uh, he's a very special man to me. Um, so you were saying, Sandy, about the letter. When you wrote the letter, what were you feeling? You know, sometimes for me, um, when someone comes on my heart, um, it comes to my head, when I start maybe, well this happens, you know, when I started writing some of the things that I felt, It really made me see um, just how much, you know, he has meant to me and done for me. And it's, a, it's a, actually a pretty good just personal exercise um, to sit down and put down why someone means what they do to you. And so I was really, uh, when I started thinking about all of those things and just started listing the things that came to my mind as really significant deposits into our relationship, I was really overwhelmed with just how deeply I felt about him. You know, you know that. Oh, yeah, my dad. Oh, I love him, of course. But sometimes, you know, really capture the depth of that feeling until you do something really actively like sitting down and recalling some of the most precious memories and then you realize you just have a, a treasure a treasure full of not just the treasure in my dad but a treasure of memories because a lot of a lot of kids don't have those kinds of memories with their dad and, uh, you know, that alone is just to be able to have good memories with my dad is something that I celebrate because, you know, you see so many things written these days about really difficult memories that people have with their dad or with their mom. So I just, I was just thankful for, for that, for having grown up in a home where I was so loved and wanted by my mom and dad.
when you began to write the letter, was it feelings that just kind of overwhelmed you? Or? A lot of times, I think this happened to me. I kind of wrote the letter, but it wasn't until I read it back, kind of put my pen down and, and read it back, read the words that I had written that I felt a, just a tremendous amount of emotion that was that comes from a history with somebody and uh, I don't know I think I'm Redundant. No. How special was the letter to your dad? My dad, he's such a he's such a tender heart. We always would tease him as we were growing up that he could cry at the drop of a hat, because he did. <laughs> and um, he tried to tell me several times, you know, how much it meant to him and. Every time he just would get choked up, and, and whenever there's nothing left for him to say, he'll just go, Whew. <laughs> and we know that when he gets to, Whew, that he doesn't have to say much more, that his feelings are transmitted by what he's not saying. Mm -hmm. Any particular part of the letter that's more special to you, or? No, because it's really all one big thought to me. It's really, it's all what was important to say. Mm -hmm. What does, um, when was the first time I guess you saw him after you'd written a letter? Did he call or call you out in Los Angeles at that time? Uh -uh, I, I had gotten home. I honestly don't remember. Did he say anything about that? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't I don't remember. I think I think we maybe talked on the phone. I can't not remember if I came home and mm -hmm. saw him. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you think of your children, since you have such a godly and a good heritage with your parents, would, would you like to leave them with a legacy like that? Very much so. And the legacy is huge, but it's so simple. I want my kids to know what I have known and felt from my parents is that there's nothing that my kids could do that would ever make me not love them. And that my relationship with them I want to be as nurturing as I feel like my relationship with my parents has, have been. And to leave them knowing that, or maybe feeling that, as I feel for my parents, that with their love and support I can do anything. And to leave that with my kids, that with their love, with my love and support to them, the sky can be the limit to them. Because it's wind beneath your wings. Is there a song that epitomizes the relationship you have with your dad? That... <laughs> You know, it's funny, but uh, I hadn't really thought about that that much until now I'm going to get really emotional. <laughs> okay. um, but it's probably the song, um, Did You Ever Know That You're My Hero? And everything I'd like to be, I can fly higher than an eagle. You've been the wind beneath my wings. 
the second verse says, you might have appeared to go unnoticed, but I've got it all here in my heart. I want you to know I know the truth. I would be nothing without you. And he's been my hero for a long time. Well, I think you got your clothes there. <laughs> you don't care if it gets emotional, do you? Okay. Hi, Daddy. You never get too old to call your dad Daddy. I'm sitting here in my hotel room in Los Angeles, suddenly realizing that Father's Day is coming up. I'm not so good at remembering well enough in advance but I don't think I ever forget altogether. I was wondering what I could give you that you don't have or don't need. Father's Days are a time of giving dads things they don't need. <laughs> and then so many heartfelt thoughts came to me about how I feel about you. And I knew I could give you some of what's in my heart. I began making a list in my head about you. Why I'm thankful for you how you have helped me grow, and I very much want to share with you these pearls. One, I'm glad I have a daddy. So many kids, old and young, don't even have a daddy for one reason or another, and my life seems less fragmented because I do. Two, I'm glad I have a daddy who wanted me and still wants me for his child. It is a most precious gift to be wanted. Three, I'm glad I have a daddy who loves me with his whole heart. Four, I'm glad I have a daddy who was never too busy and still is never too busy to stop what he's doing to give a hug or fix a bike tire or take a little girl with a broken arm to the hospital or cook breakfast in the desert on a Saturday morning or hang up some pictures in his grandchildren's room or stop to listen to a grown woman who's still his daughter say some hard things in this process of growing up. I'm glad I have a daddy who loves my mommy, a man who treats his God-given mate with such tenderness, love, and humor. Parents being and staying together seem so rare these days, and I'm glad for your example. I'm glad I have a daddy who is crazy about my children. How lucky they are. You give them access to so much of yourself. Right now it's flips and walks and hits and swings, but what you are saying to them is they matter a great deal to you. And I believe as they grow and the world begins to tug all the more at them, you have anchored them with love and acceptance so they can hopefully stand firm in who they are. I'm glad I have a daddy who has made effort after effort until he made some great connection with the other man in my life, John. My heart is so full when I see the two of you growing together. Thank you for not giving up. I'm glad I have a daddy who trusts me and has always been in my corner saying, you can do it. Hang in there. And I'm glad you trust me even when we don't agree. I suppose that's the truest test. I'm glad you let me grow and let me screw up sometimes. I know you're always there not to say, see, I told you so, but to let me rest on your shoulder and swing on the back porch without having to say anything. Daddy, I pledge to you in honor of this Father's Day to be not only a faithful and loving daughter, but a faithful and loving friend. I also pledge to be a listener for you, as you have been for me. I want to hear your joys, and I want to hear your hard things, too. Life changes a lot of things. It changes people, relationships, attitudes. But one thing that can never change but only get better is the fact that you are my daddy, whom I love with my whole heart. And on this day to honor fathers, 
You are most honored among men. And I love you today. Sandra Fay. <laughs> How do you feel when you read it again? There's so much behind those words. There's so much. When he's when it says he's always been in my corner saying you can do it, hang in there. He's still saying it after all these years. And I think as heartfelt as these words were, Friday, June 13th, 1990, they're even more heartfelt now. Are you never too old to say daddy? Never. Never too old to say daddy. <laughs> never too old to say I need a hug. <laughs> On Christmas Day, the kids were playing with them, and he was playing with them, and having their turns. Everybody has to take a turn. When all the commotion settled down, I I went, took his hand, sat down by the couch with him, and I said, I need a turn with you. He said, you got it. <laughs> there. <laughs> Are you all right? Oh, yeah. These are good feelings. <laughs> My kids say, are those happy tears or sad tears? <laughs> These are definitely happy tears. <laughs> definitely. So, are you listening and I'm talking? I think uh, you're talking, I'm listening. Okay. I don't think we're going to do another shot. We're just going to okay. do solo the shoulder. Um, I, you, I guess Rick's ready. What does, uh, do you feel in a, in a real way, perhaps, that God gave you, Ron and Carolyn, as, I guess, preparation in a sense for the ministry that you have, or that prepared you? For God was gonna they definitely uh, prepared me for what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, very much so. He definitely used them teach me lots of great things. One song that he mentioned that meant a lot to him was We Will See Him. Because I think he said that you came uh, um, over the home one time and said, uh, Daddy, you got to listen to this song. And played him the song. It really, it really meant a lot to him. Uh, I'm always, whenever I do a, a session or something, and they're always the first ones that I go and play things for. They're a good sounding board. Other than wind uh, beneath my wings, is there any song that you've sung that you think that kind of epitomizes? <sighs> and if, uh, if, if there was, would you mind singing a phrase or two? Uh, you know why there's not? Because the songs have all been about the Lord. It's yeah. it's hard to, you know, adjust my thinking right, right, yeah. about that. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. 